Thanks very much, Satomi. As Jonathan said, this is the third of a series called Jesus on Men and Women. We're unpacking Jesus' fullest piece of teaching on this area of our lives. And as we've seen, although it was prompted by that question we just heard about divorce, it's about much, much more. And even tonight, as we come to the sensitive and for some painful area of Jesus' teaching on divorce, we'll see that primarily it's still about the nature of marriage. So let me pray, lead us in prayer before we go on. Father, thank you for these words which your son spoke when he was here on earth. Please speak through them to each one of us and help us to recognize in them your truth, your wisdom, your love. In Jesus' name, amen. So please have the Bibles open, if you would, at page 824. Page 824, Matthew chapter 19. And let me begin again by reading the question that prompted Jesus' teaching here. Matthew 19, verse 3. And Pharisees came up to Jesus and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And they thought that a man could divorce his wife simply because he felt like it and that he then had the right to remarry. So the Pharisees said, a marriage is for as long as you want it, and then uh, you can move on to another one. To which, as we saw last week, Jesus said, you have not understood what marriage is. He says, a marriage is a lifelong, one flesh union between a man and a woman, ultimately created by God. So Jesus then answered their question at the end of verse 6. If you look to the very end of verse 6, this is his answer. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. In other words, God's will for us if we marry, and it's an if, not a when, but God's will for us if we marry is to recognize that he has put us into a lifelong one flesh union and to live out our relationship within that secure structure for the rest of our lives. In other words, divorce is not God's will. It is never what he desires. But these Pharisees thought it was because of the one divorce law in the Old Testament. So verse seven, they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? So just look on screen at that one divorce law of the Old Testament. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he's found some indecency in her and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house and she departs out of his house. And if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then, and here comes the only command here. This is the only command. Her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife. So clearly divorce is not permitted there, still less commanded, as they spun it, it's simply assumed as a sad and painful reality in a fallen world. It is simply assumed that sinful men will leave their wives and will invent the idea of a certificate of divorce which they think sets them free to marry again. But verse eight, Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, that is against God, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, which doesn't mean this law permitted divorce, but that it accepted that it was a reality in a fallen world which needed law to limit the damage that it did. But, says Jesus at the end of that verse, from the beginning, it was not so. So look at this first picture. We've seen how Jesus said, if you want to understand yourselves as men and women and to understand God's will for sexual relationships, you need to go back 
to the beginning, to creation. But next picture, we've seen how Jesus also said, you need to understand that you and I, that we are all fallen people, which includes having desires that we shouldn't act on, and that this is a fallen world, which includes things like divorce, which were never part of God's creation design in the beginning. And next picture, Jesus is saying that God's law was given in response to that fallen situation to limit the damage. And this divorce law was given out of God's loving concern for the woman because, as is still mostly true today, she stood to be the one hurt and mistreated. And then comes this word from Jesus, which is going to take us some careful listening. Verse 9, And I say to you, And that's like those moments back in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7, where Jesus says, you have heard something said supposedly based um, on my father's Old Testament law, but I say to you. And then God the Son authoritatively declares what his father's will actually is. And that's what's happening here. Verse 9, and I say to you, Whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Now, the first issue here is what the word translated sexual immorality means. It's the Greek word porneia, and that covered all kinds of sexual activity outside God's will. It was an umbrella term. So, for example, porneia back then, could mean all sexual activity outside marriage by single people, whether that's hetero or homosexual activity. It can't mean that in verse 9, because verse 9 is about married people. So next, porneia could mean sexual unfaithfulness in betrothal. It was used for that. And that, if you remember in Matthew 1, is what Joseph assumed of Mary on discovering that she was pregnant. And in those days, engagement, or betrothal as they called it, was regarded virtually as marriage. Although, of course, it wasn't because marriage requires sexual consummation. But if you found your fiancé had been sexually unfaithful, the expectation back then was that you would divorce, and they called it that even though you weren't married yet. What you in fact were doing was separating. You were ending a betrothal. So maybe Jesus had that scenario in mind, in which case in verse 9 he's saying, whoever divorces his wife, and then imagine him opening brackets, What I'm saying here excludes the scenario of sexual unfaithfulness in betrothal. You may end a betrothal for that because betrothal isn't marriage. And someone who ended a betrothal for sexual unfaithfulness would be free to marry in the future, just as someone who ends an engagement today is. So Jesus wouldn't want them applying verse 9 to themselves. Next, porneia could mean, back then, marriage to a close relative. There are Old Testament laws that say you must not marry a close relative, and that if you do, God does not recognize it as a true marriage, and that you should separate. So maybe Jesus had that scenario in mind, in which case, in verse 9, he's saying, Whoever divorces his wife, open brackets, what I'm saying here excludes the scenario of being wrongly married to a close relative. If that's your situation, you should separate because your relationship was never a true marriage in God's eyes in the first place. So Jesus doesn't want someone who's wrongly married to a close relative to apply verse 9 to themselves and say, I mustn't separate, when in fact they must. That's another exclusion. 
The trouble is there is nothing in the context to make us narrow down the meaning of porneia to either or both of those scenarios. So in his wisdom, Jesus may have used porneia to include those scenarios, but also the scenario of adultery. So there's one more exception or exclusion to think about. And to work out what it is, we need to start by going back to the original question in verse 3. Look at that. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? So the verse 3 scenario is people thinking they can end a marriage and go on to another one because they feel like it. So, sexual unfaithfulness in betrothal is not involved. Marriage to a close relative is not involved. And adultery is not involved in the verse 3 scenario. That means Jesus' exception in verse 9 does not apply to the people asking the question in verse 3. So for them, we can cross the exception out. So now look at verse 9 with the exception crossed out. To people thinking they can end a marriage and go on to another one just because they feel like it, Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. So these Pharisees thought you could end a marriage by divorce and that you were then free to go on to another one. Jesus says, no, marriage is a lifelong one flesh union between a man and a woman, ultimately created by God. And he teaches here that it cannot be ended by divorce. Remember these pictures? He teaches that the one flesh union, this invisible creation reality, continues even if the couple are separated in their own eyes, even if the couple are legally divorced in society's eyes. And that is why Jesus says if someone divorces and then remarries, the remarrying is an adulterous step because the one flesh union of the first marriage is still a reality. So where have we got to? I'm saying Jesus teaches that divorce is not God's will and that remarriage after divorce is not God's will either. But is there an exception to that in the scenario of adultery? I'm persuaded the answer is no. So let me give some explanation from this passage while acknowledging that a full explanation would have to draw in a whole lot of other passages and the history of their interpretation. We need to remember the question, or rather the person, that verse 3 is answering. Jesus is answering the man who is planning to initiate divorce because he feels like it so that he can leave his wife and marry again. To that man, Jesus says, verse 9, with the exception crossed out, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. In other words, if you do that you will be responsible for causing divorce. And if you remarry, you will be responsible for causing adultery. And you will be culpable before God my Father for that. That's what Jesus is saying to the verse 3 man. But in Jesus' exception in verse 9, he may be acknowledging not just the scenarios of unfaithfulness in betrothal, and being wrongly married to a close relative, but also the scenario of adultery. So in verse 9, he paints the scenario of a husband whose wife is being sexually immoral. immoral. The same, of course, would go for a wife whose husband is being sexually immoral. But in verse 9, Jesus paints the scenario where the wife is committing adultery, wanting out of the relationship, And however much the husband might wish to save the marriage, if she persists, she can make that impossible. And we also need to realize that in Jesus' day, both Jewish and Roman society would have said to the husband, you must divorce her. There was social and sometimes legal pressure to divorce in that scenario. And it was often impossible not to even for a Christian operating on principles of the desire to reconcile, if possible. 
And Jesus does not want a faithful husband or wife who has been unable to avoid divorce to feel that they are equally responsible, equally culpable for what has happened. So look at verse 9. I think Jesus is also saying, whoever divorces his wife, open brackets, I'm excluding you from being culpable for the divorce and your partner's remarriage if it was your partner's adultery and initiative that caused it. That's the other exclusion. So in the scenario of adultery, what does the exception exclude the faithful partner from? I think the answer is it excludes them from bearing a responsibility for causing divorce which they should not bear. It excludes them from feeling culpable for the divorce in a way that they shouldn't. It's so that they can read verse 9 without thinking, this is a word of judgment on me. It's not. It's sometimes said that fault is never entirely on one side, the implication being that in every divorce there is some share of responsibility for it. I do not think that is true. There are divorces where the adulterous one who wanted out really was the cause while the faithful partner has been, albeit as imperfectly as you or I, as committed as it's possible to be. And if Jesus includes the scenario of adultery in his exception here, it is to reassure faithful partners that his words do not condemn them. But it's not an exception even for them to the truth that divorce is not God's will and that remarriage after divorce is not God's will either. Let's step back. I wonder how you react to this. You might be thinking, but different Christians say different things, don't they? And there are a whole lot of other evangelical churches out there which teach that in the case of adultery, the faithful partner does have permission to divorce and remarry. I want to say I've only introduced us to Matthew 19, along with the background of Genesis and Deuteronomy. To reach a conviction on this, you have to bring in Jesus' other teaching in Mark and Luke, and Paul's summary of Jesus' teaching in 1 Corinthians 7, and more. Which, for example, Gordon Wenham does in his new book, Jesus' Divorce and Remarriage, which I recommend. And I realize that in the context of uh, the no-fault divorce culture that we now live in and the context of the wider church culture, what I've said tonight sounds extreme. It's actually what all the major teachers of the church in the first five centuries taught, except one. So there was a consensus in the first five centuries of 25 major teachers of the caliber of Augustine, Oregon, and so on, and two church councils. Now, they weren't infallible, but they knew the original language of the New Testament and the cultural background far, far better than the best scholar in the world today. And so their virtually unanimous teaching is very significant, and we need very good reason to go against it. If you look at this picture, this view then became the church's small c Catholic or universal teaching right up to the Reformation. It's then continued in the Roman Catholic Church. It also continued in the Church of England, which plowed a unique furrow in the Protestant side of things, whereas other Protestant denominations began to say that in the case of adultery, the faithful partner does have permission to divorce and remarry. But that was a new view. So in the context of 2,000 years of church history, what I've said tonight is not extreme, it's mainstream. And that's important to take on board. But in answer to the question, how do you react, you, how do you, react? you might just be thinking negatively because this seems so unloving and hard, because we, we all leap immediately to the people who, who we know are on, on, as it were, the wrong side of this already. And maybe that's 
us personally. So we need to ask, what is the positive purpose of this teaching? Is there one? And the answer is, it is to underline the true nature of marriage, which is, again, a lifelong one flesh union between a man and a woman ultimately created by God. And Jesus wants us to understand that so that if we enter it, we do so with the right mindset, which one writer puts like this. On their wedding day, a man and a woman move into the house in inverted commas of marriage together, lock the door from the inside, and mutually agree to throw away the key. And they commit themselves to self-giving love as the only way forward, promising to resolve all problems inside the house rather than reserving the option of leaving. That's the mindset. That's the mindset that it is crucial for those of you who are single to get. Because you may one day find yourself considering getting married. And as the marriage service says, it must not be undertaken carelessly, lightly, or selfishly, but reverently responsible and after serious thought. Because it is serious. Because it is lifelong. So it's loving to single people for Jesus to make the threshold that high. It is that high. But this mindset is also vital for married people to get so that we, we work at our marriages to make them better and better. I want to work at mine so that Tess wouldn't dream of wanting to walk out. And especially so that we work at them in tough times. So a while back, a couple said at the door one Sunday, you don't know this, but when we first arrived at JPC five years ago, our marriage was on the rocks and we assumed headed for divorce. But the teaching here, which we'd never heard before, called us back to working at, our, at it and gave us hope that God wanted it to work. And our marriage is now in a completely different place and we're so thankful. So it's also loving to married people for Jesus to teach this. Straight away, the obvious reaction is, <laughs> what about the opposite experiences? For example, the worst case scenario of physical abuse. Well, I was involved in exactly that scenario uh, with a young husband whom I knew well. Uh, I'd read the Bible with him. He was a steady Christian. And early in marriage, he became unpredictably angry, aggressive, and violent. Uh, and among others, among others, I counseled that his wife needed to separate immediately, although we hoped temporarily for her own safety and well-being, because Jesus' teaching is not a charter for abuse, which is unacceptable. And sadly, in that case, despite willingness to forgive and find a way forward, trust simply could not be rebuilt, and they divorced. And God knows that in this fallen world, divorce, sadly, still happens, and to Christians. Let me end with three other pastorally vital things. First, this teaching does not, not, not mean that divorce is the unforgivable sin. Whatever responsibility we may bear for a divorce, it is as forgivable as anything else. Because as we will be reminded in the communion service, on the cross, Jesus, quote, made there a full atonement for the sins of the whole world. There is nothing you can confess to Jesus that he cannot forgive on the strength of what he did on the cross. And I'd add, Jesus' teaching has reminded us tonight that we may be feeling falsely responsible for what was unavoidably caused by the other person. But reaching a point of confidence about being forgiven can be a long, long road, and it doesn't instantly take away consequences like anger or guilt or bitterness or self-hate. And many, many have found our Celebrate Recovery course a real help in working these things through after divorce. So please get in touch about that if you think it might help you. Secondly, Jesus' teaching that remarriage is not God's will is sometimes seen as, how shall I put it, almost a punishment on the divorced. And that is absolutely not true. This teaching is simply a consequence of the nature of marriage. 
that it is a lifelong one flesh union which remains a reality even after separation even after divorce and remaining single after separation or divorce witnesses to the nature of marriage because people are then expressing the reality that their sadly divorced marriage is still a reality in God's eyes And lastly, what if someone's already remarried? How are they to view their second marriages? The best answer seems to be this. Having faced the fact that they've taken a step that was not God's will, they should recognize that their second marriage is a marriage. New promises have been made which need to be honored and lived out, along with honoring any obligations to their first spouse. And I've spoken to a number of people in that situation who've come to agree with the view that I've presented tonight and who've honestly and humbly admitted the misstep that they've taken. And it's then been important for me to say to them that they shouldn't think that they're now spiritually living under some kind of cloud and that the Lord can't now bless them in their ongoing life. That's not true either. I realize I've not said everything that needs saying about these verses, let alone about the pastoral needs around divorce. I also realize that what I've said tonight may be new to you or unwelcome to you or both, in which case you will need plenty of time to process it. And I'm not expecting you to agree just like that. Step one, as my old boss used to say, my previous vicar, step one is just letting it in the room with you and just being open to the thought this might be what the Bible is saying. That's step one. As I've said the past two weeks, please feel free to respond to me by, in person or by email or however, and we'll have another question and discussion time afterwards um, if that would be of help to you. Next Sunday, we're going to finish unpacking this piece of Jesus' teaching by seeing what he has to say about singleness, not just singleness after divorce, although it includes that, but about all the varieties of singleness that are represented in a gathering like this. But single or married, this part of God's word has its hard side for us all. So we're going to use this next song again, which has become almost a song of the um, series, to express our trust in God's word, even when God's word is hard to take. Let's stand and sing.